Hi and welcome to another episode of Rob's Triathlon Tips for Beginners. I finally did it. I am an Iron Man. I heard those famous words from Mike Riley in, in Lake Placid. Uh, here's uh, the medal that I won. You can see on it uh, there's two Adirondack chairs. Uh, the Adirondack Mountains are in that area. That's why the chairs are on the medal. It's really heavy metal. Pretty cool looking. Uh, in this video I'll recap my race experience including some footage uh, from before the race of the area and my preparations and a little bit of race footage. I definitely learned a ton doing my first Ironman. Um, Lake Placid is as beautiful as it is difficult. <laughs> so if you're looking for an easy first Ironman to do, don't do Lake Placid. <laughs> when you finish it, you feel really accomplished because it is that tough. Um, so here are some clips of the venue and the area, and then I'll go into things that I learned. Just a quick video of the views that you can get in the Lake Placid area. Very nice. And now we're in the distance. There's the ski jump. Pretty awesome. So we're at Mirror Lake. So you don't actually swim in Lake Placid, you swim in Mirror Lake. And way down at that end is the swim start. And then if I pan over, you can see the red buoys. That's where you turn. It's all yellow buoys one direction and orange buoys the other direction. It's two laps. And down at the start, you get out of the water briefly. And there's supposed to be water if you want to have a drink. And then you get in and do your second lap. So, very beautiful scenery, nice clean water, and warm water, but still wetsuit legal. Just about to check my bike in. Here we're in the famous oval. I think it's for speed skating outdoors or something. That's the men's change tent. There's all the bikes. Got some kind of school. And then over here you got like a convention center. <laughs> so let's see if I can see any of the professional bikes. So it looks like there's the chute where you're gonna run from the swim. And then here's the situation with all the bags, the run and the bike bags. You gotta find your athlete number run down, find your bag and uh, right spot and then run to your, your change tent and the bathroom if you need to and then run around and get your bike and then head out that way i uh, elected to use all of my own nutrition and none of the on course nutrition during the race um, because i'm a low carb athlete so here's some clips of me explaining my my setup for nutrition during the during the race. In terms of my nutrition plan for the run, I've got a, a race vest, and in that I'm gonna have a, a zip, a couple zip locks with extra race uh, plus. I've got soft flasks that go in the front of it, and I've got these collapsible funnels. Uh, I've got one labeled dry and one wet, and they expand. It's pretty cool. It fits nicely in there for refilling. And I'm going to have a couple gels and a protein bar, and an extra pair of socks, and some body glide in case I'm chafing in my run personal needs bag at the halfway mark of the run. And I'll have three gels and a protein bar stored in the different compartments in the running vest. And what I'm going to do is actually pre-fill the soft flasks with each with an hour's worth of nutrition. Just, just the powder and seal them up. And then in transition, there's uh, bottle filling stations. So then I'll go to those and I'll fill these up shake them up, pop them in my vest, and then head out on the run. 
So my bike is ready to go for Ironman Lake Placid. I'm gonna check it in at one o'clock today. I thought I'd just go over my nutrition plan for the bike. So you can see I've got a, a bottle cage here and then one on the frame. And I'm also gonna have this arrow bottle here. This arrow bottle, I'll just have water. And then the, in those two bottle cages, I will have, um, over here it's called s fuels race plus in a concentrate so there's the one of my bottles i marked the halfway point i'm gonna put two hours worth of it in here so i drink half of it each hour and so between the two bottles it's four hours and then i've got this pouch that's going to go in behind on the seat post and I'll have a scoop and I have a Ziploc bag with some more of this to another four hours worth of it. I'm not going to take eight hours to do the bike but that's what I'll have in here. So halfway I'll stop and I'll mix up nutrition for the rest of my ride and besides the race plus I'm going to have um, you can I'll have these things in my three jersey pockets. This is Simply Protein. It's a low-carb protein bar with good flavors. And it doesn't have chocolate in it. That's going to melt and get nasty. <laughs> so I'll have those. And then I will tape three of these onto the frame, the top tube, just like that. And you, you tape them so that you can rip them and they're open. And then I'll have another one of these in that pocket behind the seat post. Another note about uh, nutrition that I'm gonna put, be putting in my bike gear bag. I'm gonna go find this morning some kind of insulated bag to keep these things from getting too hot um, before I get done the swim. <laughs> Here's a short clip of me explaining what my plan was the night before the race to try and get a good night's sleep in it. And it actually did work out quite well. I felt rested in the morning, even though I went to bed at 10 and woke up at 4 a.m. <laughs> so my evening routine before the race is to do, um, uh, my favorite 20 minute yoga. It's an evening vinyasa flow, just makes me kind of calm and nice and loose. And then I had some chamomile tea, which is supposed to help fight any kind of stress you have, help, help you fall asleep. And I set three alarms on my phone and I set one on my watch as well and then I'm gonna brush my teeth and then I'm gonna do a guided meditation and then go to sleep. And that should set me up well to fall asleep. For the morning of the race, leading up to the start of the race, I woke up at 4 a.m. I had my breakfast, um, which was like high fat, and protein, low carbohydrate, because I'm a low carb athlete, which I've gone into in another video. And then I got dressed in my morning clothes. So that was like sandals, which were just cheap sandals that I was willing to throw away. Um, I just kicked them off near the swim start. And I had um, bike shorts on, which I was gonna wear underneath my wetsuit. I had a, just a t-shirt that I put into my morning bag and I had like a pullover to try and stay warmer in the morning too, which went in the morning bag. And then I had all my swim gear. And uh, after I got dressed, then I just sort of mentally went through the steps that I needed to follow in the morning, what I needed to do in transition, how I needed to get warmed up for the swim. 
and then I walk down to the transition. I check my bike tire pressure, and then um, everything was fine. And then I dropped off my special needs bags, the run and bike special needs bags. And of course, of course, those are in two different spots. The run special needs bag was like way in one direction and everyone was wondering, you know, am I going the right way? <laughs> it's a little bit bizarre. I think they could have picked a slightly better location for that. Um, yeah, and then once that bag was dropped off, then I went to the little corner of, of Mirror Lake where people were allowed to sort of warm up in the lake, put on my wetsuit, swim cap, goggles, got in the water, just got myself settled in terms of the water temperature, which is beautiful. Um, and then I lined up, uh, they have like sign, people holding signs, sort of like pace bunnies almost. And I lined up with the 131 to 140, uh, like an hour 31, hour 40 um, group, because that's what I was anticipating. And uh, it was kind of annoying because some people were, were, were like nice and lined up way early. And then you had people who were super fast athletes who were just sort of barging through the crowd right up until the last minute because they, I don't know, felt like being jerks and warming up really to the last minute. It was bizarre. And then it, it was such a huge crowd, I think something like 3,000 athletes. And you couldn't see the professional athletes go, uh, which sucked. You could sort of hear people up front and the, and the crowd cheering for it. But they went off. And then the age groupers started about 6.30, I think. And, and I didn't anticipate how long it would take to get in the water. So you're just sort of inching forward a little bit. And then when you get to be the people who are about to start, you understand. It's because there's sort of like the start shoot with five lanes and they're letting five people go in the water at a time, separated by five seconds, which is great. It worked great. Way better than a mass start and complete chaos. And, you know, it, it was a good start to the race so that you weren't stressed out. Uh, the swim, like I mentioned previously, is in Mirror Lake, not Lake Placid. Lake Placid's kind of like a more private lake. It's not really for public recreational use. It's to the north of Mirror Lake. Mirror Lake is the lake in town that's more for recreation. Mirror Lake is super clean, very warm water, almost no waves. Uh, it was barely wetsuit legal. <laughs> I was glad it still was. Um, and I, I honestly never had such a great swim in a triathlon. I, I was amazed at how well it was going during the swim. I stayed away from people, off to the side from the buoys. I kind of went like this during the race, but I didn't care. Uh, I didn't panic at all. Um... I think I went pee like three times during the swim <laughs> and I finished in an hour and 28 minutes, which was maybe 10 minutes faster than I thought I was going to. So I was like totally thrilled with that. It's a two lap course. So when you get out of the, the, the water for a short little jog to get back in, there's like an area where you can get some water which was new to me. I've never had that opportunity before. I never trained swimming with a water bottle for that reason, but it was nice. Um, and uh, what else can I say? I can say that I'm glad that I do Wim Hof breathing uh, and, and that in the sense that it helps keep me calm if I, I can't catch my breath for a short period of time. Like if someone smacks you or something in the race, instead of panicking and gasping for air, I can just keep 
uh, just keep swimming and take a breath later uh, and be fine. And because of Wim Hof and also practicing uh, in training, like maybe breathing every four strokes or every five every once in a while, like that really paid off in the race. Any time where I was near other people, I was able to just stay calm. So that's something I would suggest is, is practicing either Wim Hof or just practicing uh, skipping breathing, maybe not every two or three strokes, maybe a little bit longer sometimes. So you're used to doing that. Uh, at the end of the swim, there were wetsuit peelers. Um, people were, you know, joking. They're not strippers. <laughs> so when I got out of the water, I took my swim cap and goggles off. I got my the top of my wetsuit down and I left my goggles and cap in my sleeve which works great and you can get those at the end of the day you're not going to lose them and then I lied down and two volunteers helped get the wetsuit off and then I carried my wetsuit to T1 that's uh, the better option because it was I'd say about like a 400 meter run to the transition area and during that time you may kind of dry out and then it would be harder to get your wetsuit off so it's better to take it off and run with it, I think, anyway. Here's a photo of me just getting out of the water after the second lap of the swim. Just thrilled to be done and that I was able to do it so quickly. And actually sort of looking off and hearing my family cheer me on, which is a first. They're never at the start of my race to see me swim or get out of the swim so I was just I was happy about that uh, in terms of the first transition from the swim to the bike uh, once you get into the transition area you go to where all the bags are and you find your bib number and you grab your bike gear bag and you run into a change tent and then the change tent it's a whole bunch of chairs uh, there's a bunch of water which is great because you might want to like rinse off your feet if you got sand on them chances are you got sand on them and you don't want sand in your feet during the whole bike ride so you can use that you can drink the water too um, people just strip right down naked in the tent so be ready for that uh, you put on you put on your, you take your bike gear out of your bike gear bag and you put your swim gear in the bike gear bag. And when you're all ready to leave the tent, you pass your bike gear bag to a volunteer and then they put it back where the bag was before, uh, where your run bag is too. And then you can go and get it at the end of the day. Uh, when you leave the tent and, and you're heading towards your bike, there's a little sunscreen station so you sunscreen up before you go out on the bike because you're gonna be out there for a long time <laughs> and then you get your bike and you head out on the course uh, in terms of my time in T1 it was a hilariously long transition I'm notoriously slow in transitions I think it took me about 18 minutes I mean I would rather take my time Make sure I don't mess anything up. I don't forget anything. I'm going to get my heart rate to call it, to slow down and then how to head out on the bike. I'm not trying to qualify for Kona or win my age group or something by any means. So, I mean, that's my attitude towards transitions. The bike course is a two lap course. It's really scenic. There's a lot of trees. Um, you're frequently next to a river or a creek and you go through some cute little towns um, yeah it's it's a really beautiful course but it's really really tough uh, all the climbing that I did in Zwift was time well spent um, one thing that Zwift can't really help you get used to is the downhills on the course there's definitely some fun downhills 
some that are like a little hair raising and scary where you're breaking because <laughs> you're a chicken <laughs> i would not want to do those if it was raining out that would scare the crap out of me um unless i had like disc brakes i had to, i just have rim brakes uh, on my road bike um people talk a lot about two hills that are nicknamed Mama Bear and Papa Bear as being the worst part of the course. And I would disagree, and, and, and a few people I talked to also agree with me that the worst hill is the first big hill out of town. It's just really long and boring, and there's no spectators there, and you're just like, ugh. And, and you got to get past that to get to where the downhills start. That was the most annoying hill. I was able to get through Mama Bear and Papa Bear both times um, decently. You've got to really watch out on the downhills at the bottom of the downhills for bottles and some sometimes visors and, and sunglasses on the road because big trucks are braking going downhill and they create ripples. And then people were losing their bottles and their visors and their glasses on the road and just carrying on so you could crash into those if you weren't careful and and maybe like wipe out and injure yourself and not finish the race so keep an eye out for that if you're doing lake placid uh, i finished in seven hours and 28 minutes which i was pretty happy with i might have gone a little too hard on the first lap i've heard that that's a common mistake um, and on the second lap, a storm front came in. It never did rain, uh, but it became really windy, and that just destroyed my legs, um, and which is why I had such a tough time on the run. Uh, I didn't do enough training outdoors with wind. That was a mistake. And I didn't do enough running off of really hard bike rides. Uh, so that's a couple big learnings for the next time I do an Ironman. Another point that I forgot to mention about the bike course is that the information you find online, is, it all conflicts in terms of how much climbing you have to do. And I guess the course changes every year. An Ironman wouldn't give me a straight answer before the race. Full gas, the simulation app kind of, um, with the Ironman Lake Placid course in it, said one thing and the athlete guide said another thing and the information that was on the website before the athlete guide came out didn't agree with the athlete's guide and then there was a little video explaining the course which didn't agree with the other three things either <laughs> my watch said that i did about 1900 meters of climbing in the end so i guess that's the mo most accurate data for the 2022 course which is like 6,200 feet or something like that. Here's a photo of me on the bike course. I think that photo is was taken coming back into town for the second loop. Um, you can see that I like to cover up when I'm on the bike course. I have white arm sleeves. Uh, then you don't have to put sunscreen on your arms and they're white so they keep you cool in the heat. I also like to wear calf sleeves and that covers your leg, a good chunk of your legs too. So you're just kind of worrying about your knee area and the top of your quads for sunscreen and then your, your neck and uh, your face. And I got, I chose to wear an aero helmet and it had enough venting for that day for the weather um, but on a hotter course i probably just would have gone with a well vented road bike helmet um, because i'm sure that the the gains in my my time on the course were minimal because <laughs> i'm not a very fast cyclist and uh, you may also notice that i just ride a road bike with clip-on aero bars i don't have anything fancy i did enjoy looking at other people's bikes uh, during the day and you could hear people coming up behind you with fancy bikes with electronic shifters and stuff and you go ooh, ooh. 
wonder what they're riding. So that was, that was part of the fun of the bike course in, in my mind. For the second transition, or I, in other words, T2, you cross, you get off your bike, and this is the first time I've ever had this, a volunteer takes your bike and puts it back on the rack for you, and you go and get your, your run bag, your run gear bag, and you go on the change tent, a change you put your bike gear in your run gear bag give that to a volunteer uh, and then you go to a different spot to get sunscreen and then you head out up to the course so that was neat to be able to just pass my bike to somebody i'm used to other races where i've had to go and rack my bike and then take my helmet off or you might get disqualified if you take your helmet off first <laughs> But there was no way for you to get disqualified for that in this race. It took me 15 and a half minutes to get out onto the run. And, I mean, reflecting on why that takes so long, similar to the first transition, I'm not in a hurry. I'm just trying to calm myself down, make sure I don't forget anything. But I'm also really slow at putting sunscreen on. So I think that's a big chunk of my transition time. <laughs> So how did my run go? Uh, not very well. <laughs> I think, like I said before, the the wind on the second lap of the bike course like took so much out of my legs um, that I think I must have walked at least half the marathon, which is, you know, sad. But I got it done. That's the most important thing: is to get your first Ironman done. It took me six hours and 12 minutes to do the marathon. <laughs> uh, basically, I was like negotiating with myself throughout it going, okay, I'm going to run two kilometers and then I'm going to walk half. And it just kept going like that. and Just trying to get through it and trying to run parts of it. Um, there are some hills on the run course that are just so brutal that almost nobody is running them, especially the hill into back into town. That is a nasty hill. And it's just, I saw some footage of it, like defeating some of the pros even. <laughs> that's, that's re it's really hard. Um, it was fun to have a glow stick when it got dark out, put that around my neck. Um, and what's different about the run is that it it does really head out of town into um, like areas where there's no spectators and it's so dark um, that you're just kind of like you feel odd and you can counter that by by chatting with um, your fellow athletes and and volunteers at aid stations a little bit you can't do that on, on the bike because you're not supposed to draft um, but yeah definitely take advantage of that that ability on the run to, to chat with people um, walk with them run with them for a while learn where they're from how many Ironmans they've done uh, get their intel and what those other races are like it makes the marathon go by in a much more enjoyable way uh, otherwise the marathon could be like a super lonely brutal experience and it doesn't have to be um, so in my 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 race in total was 16 hours and five minutes so I had 55 minutes to spare <laughs> way slower than I wanted to be I wanted to be like 14 something or you know, 15 hours. Uh, but on the plus side, since it took me so long, uh, I got my medal from professional triathlete Heather Jackson at the finish line, which was really awesome. So there's, that's a plus. <laughs> and the last photo I wanted to share is a, a shot that I really love from the finish line, which was taken by Finisher Picks. Uh, just shows like how great you feel crossing the line, how many people are there. I mean, it's hard to show the energy of it, but the finish line in Lake Placid is really incredible.
as you could see in the photo, I had uh, similar clothing to the run uh, to the bike course. I swapped my bike shorts for just running tights. Um, there, so there was no pad. Like why, why do a marathon with a pad on in your butt? <laughs> and uh, I switched my red cycling jersey for a red uh, compression top made by Under Armour. I just like the feel of that, and it doesn't have a logo that creates any kind of chafing on your nipples. I've had that issue before with fancy shirts. So, I mean, that prevents that issue. I had a, a hat, and I have a, a glow stick around my neck. If you're one of the athletes that's out when it's dark, uh, there are volunteers handing those out. Like, just grab them. It's it's kind of fun. It lightens the mood. They they may give you more than one if you want one. I just put one around my neck. Um, and that was fun. You can see I've got uh, my nutrition vest because I was using all of my own nutrition. And I have a, a race belt around my waist, which has my bib number on it, and also a little pouch with a bunch of uh, salt tabs that I kept crunching every once in a while to make sure I didn't cramp during the run. And I also had an uh, extra strength Tylenol for all the pain I was going through to help me get through the marathon. <laughs> the joint pain. <laughs> as far as my uh, fluid intake went in terms of like water, uh, I think I really nailed that. Um, uh, every aid station on the run and the bike, I got some water. Uh, it, it got pretty hot out, so I dumped some water on my head, and I had some to drink, and then I would refill my arrow bottle on the front of my bike with water at every aid station so that I wouldn't run out of water on the course. Um, during the swim, I think I peed in my wetsuit like three times. I think I peed three times on the bike, and I lost count of how many times <laughs> I peed on the on the run. So I think I did a, an adequate job of staying hydrated during the race. So Ironman Lake Placid was my first Ironman, and also my first triathlon as a low-carb athlete. And so it was an experiment, and it went it went perfectly uh, in my opinion i'm i've been eating low carb for six months not keto but just low carb uh, not that as strict as keto and uh, i've been training low carb with s fuels trains product um sort of building my fat oxidation rate and getting my stomach used to consuming that product and uh, you can find another video on my channel recently of me running through calculations on why people bonk, where I figured out what my hourly intake of carbs should be based on what I think my fat oxidation rate is. Um, and it went well. I felt energy-wise that I was fine the entire race, and I, my stomach never bothered me during the race. Um, it was just like the bike course was hard enough without a headwind the whole second lap and that just took too much, beat, beat my legs up way too much for me to, to run very much in the marathon. Um, I did see maybe a handful of people during the day sort of bent over thinking about barfing. <laughs> Um, trying not to barf up all the carbs they're cramming into their system. I mean, so that can be the drawback of being so dependent on carbs is if you haven't practiced it or you're taking in too much, you can be rough on you during your race. Uh, but I didn't have any issues at all uh, with my nutrition. Um, I will say that the UCAN gels that I used are very... They, I wouldn't call them gels. They're very liquidy and because of the heat maybe and super chalky 
I mean, I would use them again because I don't really have another alternative. But I would know to anticipate that the next time. Just kind of meh. Not, not really the greatest texture in your mouth. <laughs> the S Fuels Race product tasted better than the UCAN stuff, the UCAN gels. And it mixed fairly easily during the day. But it was also a little bit chalky. Maybe that's just the way that some products are. Or are these sort of lower carb products are, maybe. But I would definitely use both products again in future races. And have like no fears at all of, of doing uh, triathlons in the future as a low carb athlete. You may be wondering how the recovery went for my race. I would say that after about five days, I felt pretty normal. Um, we were on vacation in New York State, and just sort of the first part of our vacation was the Ironman prep and race. And so once the race was done, um, we did lots of walking. And so I'm pretty sure that that's, it's important to keep moving when you're recovering, whether that's walking or something low impact like swimming. But I think those are good choices. You don't want to just sit on the couch. Uh, my body seemed to go through phases where one body part hurt and then that would stop hurting. And it was almost like it would, the pain would move somewhere else, like move to my lower back. Once my calves start, stopped bugging me, <laughs> I wasn't able to take, you know, uh, an ice bath or anything. Uh, I've, I've read that that can help a lot if you can do that after a race, but uh, I would definitely say don't stop moving when you're trying to recover. I think that's a mistake. Uh, lessons learned. Probably one of the most interesting parts of this video for many people. Um, this is my first time doing a full Ironman and my first time doing a, a two lap bike course this long. And uh, something I wasn't ready for is how lonely the second lap of the bike course can be. Uh, the field of athletes kind of stretches out after the first lap. And you've got to be mentally prepared to just be on your own. And sometimes you don't get passed by anyone or pass anyone for quite a long time. And there's long stretches of the course where there's no spectators and you're just kind of lonely and feel weird. Like, like you're not in a race. <laughs> you can't really chat with people for very long anyway because you're worried about course officials being behind you and giving you a drafting violation, right? I did see someone get a drafting violation on the course and it, it was idiotic. They were chatting with somebody and a motorcycle was right next to them and they were just ignoring them and they had their stopwatch out and were like, okay, yeah, you <laughs> you're, you got to stop at the next penalty tent. It was idiotic. <laughs> they were just oblivious. Uh, so yeah, so I an anticipate maybe feeling a little lonely on the bike course. Um, one, the one place that I had chafing was where my timing chip went around my ankle. And I didn't think about that. I've never had that issue in a, in a half Ironman. But I guess during a full Ironman, you can get some chafing there. It's a long enough event. So maybe the next time I would put some Vaseline on the inside of the ankles, uh, the chip strap. There was Vaseline in the changing tents. Uh, so maybe that's something to think about. Um, I'll make a separate video on sunscreening during an Ironman because that's not something anybody really focuses any attention on in triathlon videos and that frustrates me they just say just slap it on get out well there's a lot more to it than that uh, so i'll make a video on that uh i was super happy with the performance of my 
my watch, my Coros Pace watch. It's the first generation Pace. It's not a fancy watch. Uh, the GPS worked great. I was on the course for you know 16 hours, and my battery went from 100% to 53%, which is crazy performance for a triathlon watch. For it to last the whole race, there were several people whose watches were dead. And they had fancy Garmin watches. And I was like, why don't you get a Koros? <laughs> so I'll make a, a video on the watch that I have. Um, let's see, I'm just looking at my notes here. There was a part on the second lap of the bike course where the bottom of my left foot started to hurt where, where there's pressure from the pedal. And I thought, uh-oh, how am I going to run a marathon? And how am I, I going to be able to finish the bike ride? My foot really hurts. And I was able to overcome that by shifting my foot forward in my shoe and putting pressure in a slightly different spot on my foot. And that pain ended up going away. So that was lucky. Um, a lot of people were talking about having bad cramps during the bike and the run, even though they swore that they were hydrating and getting lots of electrolytes. Uh, and I don't think it was a coincidence that, from what I can remember, none of them had compression socks on. And so I think that's the importance of those socks. Uh, they help prevent that. I didn't have any issues during the race until the very end where I thought, okay, I need to start running as I come up on the finisher shoot. <laughs> then my legs were kind of cramping a little bit in the calves. But the, the whole rest of the day, I was fine because of the compression sleeves that I had on my calves. So, um, yeah, a couple of people I chatted with during the run um, said that they had done other Ironmans and they had done flat courses and they said not to do those courses for the reason that the bike especially the bike can be super boring uh, because if you don't have at least some rolling hills then you're just pushing the same power for hours and bored out of your mind you're not shifting gears and i hadn't really thought of that so that's kind of made me think Maybe I don't want to do something like Ironman Texas or something that is super flat or Florida or something. So that was interesting intel to get from people. Um, what else do I have here? It's definitely worth paying for the photos from finisher picks if you have the money for it. Uh, my wife took some photos during the day, but they're not necessarily of the the right moments or of the right quality or maybe they're blurry and then you you've got that backup from finisher picks um especially like the finish line or something maybe you're like my wife took a video of it but it wasn't focused but there's some great photos from from finisher picks uh, to look back at in the future so i would spend that money if you're thinking about whether it's worth it or not um and what else i think my my biggest change in in training going forward is going to be two things um way more running after a hard bike ride like a lot of like a hard climbing workout in zwift i'm gonna make sure i run every time like always doing bricks off of hard bike rides so that i'm used to that uh, and I'm going to do even more strength training than I was doing before to try and make my whole lower body as resilient as possible before the next time that I do an Ironman. Uh, I feel like my upper body is, is strong enough. My back is strong enough for all the twisting and being on the, in, in the, the position on the bike. But my lower body could be stronger. My hips, my glutes, my hamstrings. So I'm going to focus way more on strength training. 
So my plans for uh, triathlons in the next few years are basically to rebuild to an Ironman and do that slowly over four years. Um, I have the same kind of feeling after finishing Ironman Lake Placid as I had after finishing my first half Ironman, which is kind of like this sort of empty now what kind of feeling. And then i got to kind of figure out how to rekindle my love of doing triathlons. So next year I'm going to do a sprint or two sprint triathlons, just local races. Then the following year, um, one or two triathlons, maybe a sprint in an Olympic distance. And then the following year, do a sprint and a 70.3 again. And then in 2026, do another Ironman. And my preliminary thought is to do Ironman Mont Tremblant. It's one that I was registered for before, but it was canceled due to COVID. And it's supposed to have possibly the only swim that's nicer than Lake Placid's, which was beautiful. <laughs> so I'm, I'm drawn by that. Um, I definitely don't want our family vacations to just center on um, where I'm racing every year either for the next few years. So that, that's that's going to be a, a break in, in that sense um, for my family. We can just go wherever. I'll just focus on races that I can get to in my car. Hopefully you found that video to be interesting. If you did, please give it a like. Make sure you're subscribed to my channel for future videos and share the video with your friends and family. You may benefit from it. Thanks.